There we go. Well, um, I am delighted to be back. A lot has changed. The um, Before <clears throat> I get started, let me first thank my wife, whose uh, sufferance with me with my hobby has just been fantastic. Without her, you all would be subject to my horrible spelling and the resulting sometimes embarrassing wordos. Um, she suffered through the dry runs. She often finds very interesting things for me, so she deserves just a lot of thanks. Um, as you know, I got into this because I was interested in world disruptions. Uh, since we last talked, we had a bunch more papers from surprisingly more journals that I hadn't seen before. And our mouse has gotten slightly less nasty, though he is still nasty. Uh, this is the outline. I'll spend a little bit of time on what we previously covered, update it. We'll spend most of the time at the end on new topics, uh, which I think should be of general interest. I hope they will be. Now, these are the topics that we covered on January 12th, you know, a surprising number of topics, but this thing has impacted both us and the world in a myriad of ways. I'll give brief updates on each of them. Um, what I'll do is describe the topic. I'll let you read the synopsis and I will only discuss the updates. Okay, from a historical viewpoint, the big change is the death rate that I discussed has quadrupled, about a factor of two from underreporting and another a factor of two from the variance. Even with that, it is a historically very low death rate. Um, the worldwide spread, of course, it already happened. Death rates reported continue to grow linearly. Interesting that it is linear. The virus itself uh, the big change is the infection rate has at least doubled for some of the variants. Might be more for the recent Indian one. Where did it come from? Well, nature is becoming more inconclusive and the lab theory is gaining momentum and it's tied to that 2012 Chinese mine viral outbreak that we talked about four months ago. That said, it independently emerged in four countries in late 2019, so nature's hanging in there. The spike protein and the receptor, which we'll talk about in a bit more detail next, more and more weird stuff has been discovered. I showed this chart before with the virus and its protruding spike protein on the left. That spike is why it's called a coronavirus. After it attaches to the cell on the right with an enzyme called the ACE2 receptor, it steals some of our chemicals to cut it loose and then help it enter our cell. One of the bizarre new things that's been discovered is it follows the circadian clock. Very surprising. Uh, the disease, uh, more and more has been found out about it, a surprising amount. Uh, it, reinfection is not, not rare. I'll get to the statistics in the most in a moment. Variants mess everything up, including reinfection. Um, the typical infectious period is about 14 days quite a bit longer for immunocompromised people, several months. I'll talk about long COVID and what I mean by this dance of the seven veils. We went through this chart before. I thought I'd put it up again because it's so important and it shows the progression of the disease. On the left, <clears throat> on the top is an exponential scale. As the virus replicates to having several trillion copies, in our bodies. It goes through a quiet period, then infectious, partially with no symptoms, and then with symptoms in about 60% of the people, and then a period 
where it is not infectious, but you'll still test positive. Basically, it's messing up our innate immune system. We have two, the innate, the red you see on your arm when you hit it or you're stung by a bee, and the adaptive, the things that generates the antibodies that vax from, our, from being vaccinated. First, it's underactive, and you get this explosive replication of the virus, and then it becomes overactive, and you get this thing called the cytokine, as well as other storms, which causes the hyperinflammation that is the hallmark of the disease. It's diabolical. It messes us up in all kinds of ways. Red are things that have been discovered uh, since we last talked. Now, it is a deadly dance. Um, here's a chart I put together that plotted on a log scale COVID deaths versus age. You see how crucial age is as a com comorbidity to this virus. The flu, the flu also uh, tracks roughly a log scale. Um, uh, this is from a British medical journal paper. Um, so, you know, it's kind of interesting that it's these exact fits. The seven veils is more and more things are being discovered. Perhaps the biggest is that it engenders something called autoantibodies. Those are antibodies that attack us. They affect at least 55 of our cells. They're an autoimmune time bomb. In other viral infections, autoimmune problems have shown up 13 to 18 years after the infection. They're already implicated in the central nervous problems and they're a smoking gun of growing interest. I read three peer-reviewed papers on them within the last week. This is astounding. We have about 30,000 genes, about 20,000 of their expression into proteins are changed. That, you know, that's just amazing. Many, you get many more proteins of one type and many few of another. Basically, it is changing our body. Reinfection, we thought was very rare when we got together. Now we find it happens at roughly the same rate as though you had the mRNA vaccine. Rare, but it happens. However, some variants, particularly the P1 in Brazil, make reinfection very, very likely. The root causes of why we get sick are just starting to be discovered. They're all tied to things very early on in the immune system, particularly something called natural killer T cells. If you have a lot of them, you're in good shape. If you don't, you're in trouble. The disease, um, Progression really hasn't changed. We'll get more details on that later. As I mentioned, there's more and more understanding of what are the key causes uh, to the increase, uh, um, to the progression. Symptoms and comorbidities, more and more comorbidities have been identified. This is a wonderful chart from The Economist showing the impact on hospitalization and risk of death from just one comorbidity. Death in red, hospitalization in gray. Men are the top and women are the bottom. You, you don't wanna be a guy. Notice the impact of just a single comorbidity. Imagine if you had many. Since we talked, these are additional comorbidities that have been identified. Two of them, schizophrenia and very bad gum disease are even worse than age. The social economic impact, everything you read, it's getting worse. Uh, for example, 43% of the children in the world 
could not do virtual learning. Their learning has been set back by more than a year. There, be, there will be years of damage <clears throat> to underdeveloped countries. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, antivirals, that is drugs that stop the virus before it enters us, is the major focus and promise. There's been little to no progress in treating respiratory failure. In fact, no respiratory disease has a 100% cure. Drugs had to be modified for variants and many herbs, uh, saffron just today from cell, have useful effects. Treatment, progress has ceased. And much of the early progress, this was very surprising, was variant influenced. A variant helped. This is an extension of a curve we saw before. It went through August when we last talked, and it showed the progression in mortality in various age groups, as well as all people who tested positive. The first variant of interest was something called D614G. It greatly reduced mortality rates. As a matter of fact, most of the, in, the decrease in March to May was from that variant. Drug use has dramatically changed with more and more antivirals being applied and some of the early drugs, particularly the one recommended by Trump, dropping to zero. Notice most of the drugs address inflammation. Uh, charts uh, I showed before, but very important. You want to go to a very good hospital. Their performance is better. And the, the main correlator is the number of ICU beds. I said this before, but it's crucial to repeat. You quickly go to a large hospital. If you get ARDS, that's the severe pneumonia, you are really in trouble. You must avoid it. Okay, it spreads uh, mainly through the air. There are now detailed studies that asymptomatic and symptomatic spread are the same. Be careful on the CDC indoor guidelines. Aerosol, the tiny droplets, disperse great distances indoors. More on this later. Good news is schools are safe. Three foot distancing, good ventilation and mask students and teachers make school safe. The darndest study was surprise, surprise, drinking impacts social distancing. That one got my golden fleece award. Testing, many more tests, all kinds of tests. Bees are even good for finding it. You can get at home tests. Um, some of the variants are undetected by some tests. Got to be careful. This one's astounding. 75% of the people with fevers did not get a test within seven days. I find that unbelievable. Uh, contact tracing has been astoundingly effective in some countries. It won't be in the U.S. We don't have a, natural, a national app. We don't use it in the testing compliance. All combined will make it ineffective at stamping out the final clusters. Masks, they're the best. Get N95. They're the best thing you can do other than a com complete quarantine. Disinfecting, big thing. Low temperature increases the time the virus can last. Social distancing, back to this. Indoors with poor ventilation is very dangerous because of aerosol transmission. As a matter of fact, six feet is no better than 60 feet. The stuff just spreads. Lockdowns, they work more on that later with the UK. People behave, uh, domestic air travel is returning. International is still at 25%. Mexico from the U.S. is greater than pandemic, and there are all kinds of new pandemic 
triggered behaviors. We talked about remote work before. All the studies say it has exploded and it's going to continue. Likewise, telemedicine has exploded and will continue. And shop at home has grown and will continue. With virtual um, learning, you can hire a teacher to do your exams. Some of them are pretty expensive. Been amazing weight changes. 42% of the people gained 29 pounds, 18% lost 26. That was related to financial strain. They just couldn't get food. The flu disappeared and a very sad one. In India, people are bathing themselves with cow dung, which sadly increases the rate of black fungus, which has been very deadly in India. How will it end? Well, vaccines. Some are spectacular, some aren't so good. Their effectiveness is reduced by some variants. The mRNA are very good, by the way. New vaccines, <clears throat> astounding ones, are in the pipeline. Um, herd immunity is not going to happen in the U.S., both because of behavior and the variants. Some uh, controls are putting in place trying to force vaccinations, like passports and college requirements. Okay, the vaccines, <clears throat> they're really both magic, they're very, they have a great mystery and there's great optimism. Tricky details matter. They all use the spike protein, but they have different effectiveness and different side effects. Even vaccines that use the identical spike protein invented by a Dartmouth researcher, Doug, if you're still on, called 2P, have different effects and side effects. Likewise, with Johnson & Johnson, AstraZeneca, and Sputnik, which use cold virus vectors. China, using the tried and true, only had a 50% effectiveness. AstraZeneca has no effectiveness against the South African variant. We badly need a vaccine antibody test to see how are we doing. The reason we needed is this wonderful, wonderful study that plots vaccine efficiency against, on a log scale, the relative amount of vaccine antibodies relative to what you would have if you'd been infected. That's the blue vertical line. You see how astoundingly good the mRNA vaccines are, way up at the top and how bad the Chinese vaccine is way left at the bottom. The field experience on Pfizer is stunningly good. I left the details on the 95% confidence intervals on this chart because they're so tight. This should make us old folks feel very, very good. These vaccines just plain work. So there's great cause for optimism. The MNR vaccines are a major advance. The multi-vaccines are showing early trial success. We'll probably have a single flu and COVID vaccine annually, might I add. And mutation dynamics are driving vaccine design. They will be mutation resistant. Okay, long COVID. We briefly talked about it before. More details now as the concern about it have greatly grown. This is a chart on the left showing all the kinds of symptoms, a high level view might I add of them. But what it shows most importantly is severity it is related to how severe your disease was. Green if you were only positive, red if you were hospitalized, and purple if you went into the ICU. That's good news for the vaccinated folks. There are three symptom subgroups that clump together, fatigue, cognitive impairment, and nervous system impairment. Lots of different effects, at least 
five different systems have been identified. Some as bad as 8.5 drops in IQ, cardiac inflammation, increased risk of death and hospital readmission, even problems with asymptomatic cases. It's very frequent. Most of the papers say it's about 30% of the cases, some say future. At 30%, that would mean there are 10 million people in the United States suffering from it right now, and at least 100 million in the world. It affects hospitalized children. It can care immediately or months after. There's no post-vaccination data, but the non-hospitalized and mild case data suggest lower rates. It's happened before, this isn't new. Happened with the Russian flu and the Spanish flu. It happens after the regular flu, it's called chronic fatigue syndrome. It's not understood. Uh, US is gonna spend 1.15 billion on it, trying to figure out what in the heck is it? Is it a viral infection? Post-vaccination helps some. Autoimmune, remember that autoimmune thing I mentioned? Or is it just leftover damage? Probably a combination of all three. I got interested in national vulnerability. Why were some nations doing well and some nations not doing well? Here are a variety of parameters that have been implicated in one paper or another in individual and national vulnerability. You know, it's a very, very complicated problem. So I did a correlation. I know correlation is in causation. Sometimes it is. Study on these parameters. And of course, they're in the simple answer. Mencken said that a long time ago. Part of the reason that my little study was tough is the global data is opaque. Death rates are off by a factor of two to three from my little study and a couple of papers that were published uh, after it. Cases are off by a factor of seven to nine because some countries don't wanna say they're in trouble. There's individual and national shame. It's hard to get this data and the asymptomatic mystery, which we discussed before, make it really tough. Um, these are the countries I looked at. You know, I tried to look at different regions around the world, countries that were doing well, countries that weren't doing well. And these are the selected results by world regions. The last column on the right shows what the death correction factor on average, it differed by country, needed to be done for that region to get its deaths um, roughly right, either based on excess deaths or data on what their infection rates had been. So you can see huge changes. Green are the countries that were doing the best. Red are the countries that were doing, or the regions doing the worst. If you look at the Indian subcontinent, and you look at all that, those reds, which we'll discuss later, you can see why they're in such terrible, terrible trouble. If you look at the great countries, the great island nations, the one that did best, nothing particularly distinguished them. If you look at us, showing our rank out of the 74 countries, the smiley face says we're doing pretty well. The frowny face says we're doing pretty poorly. So even though we're rich, we spend a lot of money in high health care, we're pretty bright, no population, we are obese, our life expectancy really isn't good what it should have been, and our death rates were really terrible. By the way, we're also the most individualistic country in the world, and we have the most guns. So very busy chart, but it makes really uh, two points. One, these are the correlation studies on some of the parameters I looked at. Where the US is on these charts is the red circle. So if you look at the leftmost top chart, obesity, 
on this chart, our debt, it shows our death rates relative to the obesity trend line. We're above that trend line. If you look at all the other trend lines, they kind of make sense. They track what you would think would happen. But notice the US is above the trend line in every single chart. Now, what really did influence national vulnerability? First, it was strong and effective science-based governmental institution. And an interesting thing called cult cultural tightness. Cultural tightness means the government says you to do something, or the society says, will you do something? Will you do it? And here's a result from a wonderful paper, Log Scale, that correlated cultural tightness increasing to the right and COVID deaths going down. So if countries paid attention to their leaders and their leaders were pretty good, they did very, very well. Some countries didn't stand a chance. For example, Africa has twice the COVID-19 death rate. So the answer is actually pretty simple. It was these things on the chart. Did you pay attention to good policy? And did you have science-driven good leaders? So there really was a simple answer. Now let's look at the US. These are the countries that did unusually well, and these were their common behaviors. The first two are the ones we've already talked about. Their warring parties made peace. They had frequent, consistent communication. They had a centralized response. They had universal health care, and they learned from the past. Try that against how we did. And by the way, our lack of adherence to public health policies has and is hurting. The top chart shows the case rate for all the states with plotted by the Biden advantage over Trump. So at the top, Biden did well over Trump. At the bottom, Trump did well over Biden. You can see the case rate increases as the Trump margin increases. The vaccination are following the identical pattern. The Trump states are being vaccinated much less. And this is showing up in US and unvaccinated death rates. This is from the Washington Post yesterday. You can get cases, death rates, hospitalizations for the US and states. There's the overall US death rate dropping like a rock with vaccines. Notice the different with unvaccinated people. They're the ones that are causing the remaining deaths. Okay, economics. World economics are first characterized by different responses. The rich countries shown in blue could do more. They had more money and they invested more of it in things associated with the response. The African countries didn't have money and even then they couldn't invest much of it. In Europe, the European countries put much of their money into employment with employment support, so they had no unemployment. Stock markets around the world took a real dive in March and all of them but Britain with, <clears throat> with the Brexit two-step uh, recovered quite a bit and continued to do well through the year with the fascinating one of India in the last two weeks having this huge gain with the terrible pandemic. You know, really bizarre. Uh, the world is overheating. There's cash all over the place. It is showing in pent up, uh, pent up demand in car purchases, home remodeling. Just in the US, the $2 billion of frequent flyer miles that will be rapidly spent. This is what happened uh, to GDP around the world in 220. 
221, the IMF is, says it's going to be a very good year and then get back to normal in 222. The US, it's a really interesting, confused economy. It's strong, it's inequitable, it's in flux, but it's very fragile. It's expected huge productivity boom. Money is being invested like never before in ways to improve productivity. Unemployment continues to be inequitable. There's this funny open jobs paradox where there are lots of open jobs with many things making it confusing. Some businesses aren't, aren't open yet. People are afraid, kids are at home, government support, people say, I got money, why well, go to work, early retirement. So it's quite confused. The changes, the virtual changes that we talked about, let me repeat, appear to be enduring. We're going to do more things at home. That's that home nesting line. Um, some things are going to drop back, but some things are going to stay very high. What's going to happen with the cities is uncertain. The top graphic shows the flight to the suburbs, the bottom, the flight from the cities. You see what's happened to New York apartment vacancy rate. It's gone up by about a factor of four. The US economy is overheated. There's money all over the place. We've seen that in growing inflation. There are asset bubbles all over the place. The home index is the same as it was at the housing uh, bubble. Uh, Bitcoin has been very volatile, uh, but it still represents a bubble and bankruptcies are expected to skyrocket this year as the restraints on eviction and loan foreclosure will be removed. There have been four technologies, all representing decades long research, that have been crucial in getting this virus under control. The first is uh, genetics. Uh, which will be discussed during that wonderful CRISPR discussion on June 2nd that was previously mentioned. Um, based on DNA uh, discovered in 53, the first 2.7 billion dollar sequence in 2001, there's still not a complete one, but you can get a pretty good one for about 500 bucks. It was crucial in all the analysis of the vaccines and the variants and is now part of basically all drug applications. Drug applications now say this drug is addressing this protein, which does that. Gene therapy is very slow. There are only 19 approved gene editing drugs and only one drug for COVID has been proposed, but is not yet in a gene therapy trial. CRISPR in a decade or so could change the game. Uh, software and molecular biology was also crucial to vaccines. All the asterisk points were very, very important for vaccines to understand and detail the analysis Two days after the analysis was done, Moderna knew what it wanted in its vaccine. Two days because they had that sequence. Artificial intelligence, the great promise for the future, is viewed as either a savior or a saboteur, but it's making progress. Protein folding, proteins fold typically in a unique way. When they don't, they're called prions and this rare case can cause disease like cow disease. Understanding that folding has been an elusive problem. And just this year, a um, Google program got very, very close to being able to determine structure. Next year, certainly happen. An interesting technology, a microscope that works at liquid nitrogen temperature using thin slices and costs seven million bucks a piece is astoundingly precise. 
It's measured the distance between the hydrogen atoms and water and can now measure 1 250 if the width of a hydrogen atom. It was crucial in the measurement of everything associated with this virus. This is the heat kit version of one of these things. And this is an image, an astounding image from um, one of these microscopes. And it is of all the amino acids on the spike protein. That red arrow points to a mutation, E484K, that we'll come back to, shown in red. And that is what impacts the neutralization of, <clears throat> excuse me, some vaccines and many monoclonal antibodies. The final technology that's important is nanotechnology. The first one was the transistor, got popularized by Feynman. We spent a lot of, lot of money on it, 1.8 billion this year as well as last uh, month I had. It was key to vaccines. mRNA vaccines would not happen without one. Here's an image of an mRNA vaccine. Um, the RNA, the mRNA is wrapped up in lipid nanoparticles. They protect it when it gets inside the cell. And then um, when, it, when it is outside the cell and they melt when they get inside the cell. All these technologies came together literally just in time. Okay, mutations have been the big topic. What is a mutation? It's just part of evolution. <clears throat> they're very frequent, they're random changes or recombination, take one piece of one virus, combine it with a piece of another. They change things, they delete things, they insert things. There are a lot of them just on the spike protein. As of February, there were 4,150. 4, and this is the typical drawing you see that describes the mutations in a variant, little arrow showing that they take place. There's an accelerating rate and models actually predicted that in July, there'd be a big increase in case and death rates with expected mutations. Now, the way we find the mutations is something called sequencing, that gene sequencing I mentioned before. 140 countries have contributed to it from all over the world, but notice the different rates <clears throat> by places in the world which gives a huge selection bias. These, this is who sequenced in the last 90 days. By the way, the USA, the USA in November would not have been on this list. This is a Biden initiative. <clears throat> we now sequence more than any other country in the world. The frightening part of this chart is Africa and Central America where a large part of the population, many countries do zero sequences. We don't know what's happening there. Now, a very interesting story is associated with variants, which we'll talk about next. <clears throat> and uh, variants follow a tree. As something changes, a new branch of the tree happens. And this is a branch of the tree shown in yellow are the bad guys. Notice this variant we talked before on the left, E484K. Well, it has shown up in all, in all the variants of concern, all of them. And another one that just popped up in Japan. So many mutations show up in many variants. This is shown on the variant chart. Again, a variant is a collection of mutations going across the top of variants of concerns, those are the ones we worry about. They impact transmission, how vaccines performed, how deadly it is, and intense ones that we were worried about. By the way, the New York one was recently shown not to be worrisome, even though it contained that nasty mutation. Mutations are typically broken to ones that increase transmissibility and those that increase 
uh, antibody neutralization, that is make vaccines less effective. Prevalence changes very, very quickly. That's how quickly it changed in the US in just a few short months. It's a very local effect. This is the distribution of the variants in New Jersey. It's county Pacific, uh, specific and differs greatly. The uh, variant discovery is rapidly increasing. That's partially because we're sequencing more and partially because you're just more variants. The impacts. You get sick more often, you die more often, you get reinfected. That 100% is the P1 uh, variant in Brazil. Vaccination effectiveness is very dependent. The mRNA vaccines are very, very good. Upgrades are already independent. And they reduce monoclonal antibody. The monoclonal antibodies are the best drugs. 100% reduction in one of the early ones for which the FDA withdrew approval, but there are effective new uh, antibodies that have multiple monoclonal antibodies. Okay, the third wave. Well, it's a combination of knucklehead behavior, variants versus the vaccines. This is a chart of the US versus the EU showing case rates per million, seven day average, and <clears throat> date along the bottom. Red is when we were doing worse than the EU. Green is when we were doing better. Red was our knucklehead behavior. Variant is when one of the variants, the B1.1.7 variant took off in the UK, more in that later, and elsewhere in Europe. When vaccines came in, the case rate shot down. Our behavior in the holidays, when people went home to see their family and friends and Thanksgiving and holidays cost 115,000 deaths, 115,000 deaths. Now, what happened in the UK are really two stories. Again, the case rate shot up in the UK as the variant hit, and they made a gamble to delay the second vaccine rate. And as vaccines went up, the uh, variant shot down. Interestingly, the case rate for 35 and 34 year olds stayed the same in March because they were socially active and they weren't vaccinated. Another big thing that the UK did was lockdown. They fully locked down for a long time and then slowly reopened as the colors show and then have still been doing a phase reopening just last week opening pubs and restaurants. They're very worried about the Indian variant, which we'll discuss before because of its increased transmissibility and you need two vaccine doses. So they have to catch up. Let's talk about India. India has had a huge confirmed daily case rate. It's probably triple that, by the way. What happened were two things. A variant, this B1.167 took off, much more transmissible, highly reduced vaccine effectiveness. India was a disaster waiting to happen. Compare their finances, pollution, population density, vaccination rates to ours. They were just ready to happen. And then they had terrible leadership. The leadership denied the crisis, denied there was oxygen shortage. They imprisoned people who disagreed with them. They had political rallies without masks and religious celebrations. In April, as this thing was taking off. And the problem they have now is they need 2 billion shots for herd immunity. The world has only had 1.6 billion shots. So they can't get herd immunity. Vaccines aren't going to get them out of it. The likely outcome is 1 to 2 million deaths. 
And what's happening is we're vaccinating world. This is what's happening in the US. Our herd immunity goal is about 85 to 90. 5%, it will be cut down by those people who were infected and not vaccinated. Biden hopes to get to 70% by <clears throat> July 1st. This is where we are now. Um, the good news is many people are fully vaccinated. You see the 65 and older and the 18 and plus. And the vaccination rate is dropping off, but it's starting to tick up, kick up a little after the 12 to 15 year olds were eligible. Our big problem is some states aren't getting vaccinated. This is the difference in the vaccination rate by states. 47% of the Trump voters don't plan to get vaccinated. And as you'll see later, this is a real problem. The world problem, is that the developed countries are getting vaccinated, but the undeveloping countries are not. These are um, <clears throat> the percent of vaccination by regions or countries in the world who've received at least one dose. The world challenge is kind of interesting. I've already mentioned the dose rate. These are the doses that we need for full vaccination, plus what I think will be annual boosters. boosters. There is enough manufacturer capacity. The problem is getting them there and delivering. You see what the present rates are in India, Africa, and Bangladesh. They need a lot of support, expertise, patent relief, funds. It can be done, but it's gonna take a lot of work and a lot of support. Nudges are happening, doing polio. Elvis was the icon to get people to get polio vaccines. Um, girls started to sell peanuts to get money for people to get vaccinated. Um, vaccine centers or pop-up centers are hoping, hopping up because for some people, it's really hard to get vaccinated. If you go to <clears throat> Dracula's castle, you get a free vaccine. And in beer, you get a shot and a beer. Uh, in Jersey, you get a shot and a beer. You talked a little bit about what should you do. This is a chart we sh showed before, where basically the epidemiologist said, stay outside, wait until people are vaccinated and really wait. That's what that chart said. CDC has slowly been opening things up a little faster than I would have liked. And I'll get to that in the next chart. Uh, this is what uh, New Jersey has announced. But something very important to remember is the epidemiologists think the world has changed. They do not think this vaccine has disappeared. Recall all flu pandemics and 75% of all flu cases came from the Spanish flu. Only smallpox has been eradicated. So how about the CDC guidance? Is it premature? Well, first it's not enforceable. We don't have vaccine passports. So how do you know if somebody's been vaccinated? And many of the people who haven't been wearing the mask are the ones who won't get vaccinated. Why would they wear a vaccine now? As a matter of fact, the searches for fake vaccine cards shot up um, <clears throat> by a factor of 100 on the day of the announcement. That same day, literally the same day, the New York Times published a survey from those epidemiologists, a new one. How long should you wear masks? They basically all said for at least a half a year. Some said for a year. I looked at it in a slightly different way, put together this chart. Say you go in a restaurant. The red line is what the US case average was the day of the CDC announcement was the New York case average. New Jersey was half that at five. And then as a function of the people in the room, what is the chance you will run into an infected person? <clears throat> so in New York, if you went into a restaurant with 40 people, you had almost a 10% chance 
of running into an affected person. <clears throat> Remember the comment I said before, if you're in a closed room, that aerosol infection spreads. Well, you say, well, that's okay. So I said, well, say the risk I was willing to take would be the same risk I was willing to take as being infected and having to go into the hospital with the flu. Well, this is how many people would have to be in that restaurant for my infection chance to be the same as going into the flu. And I said, New Jersey was at five. So that's about 30 people. So how are we behaving? That's a question I get most on our Zoom calls. And then my wife who helps me so much says, you're asking Dr. Death? Because I'm pretty conservative. By the way, you should know, I, before this flu, I wasn't. These are the silly things we did. And New Jersey case rate is dropping like a rock. It's great. Well, these are my motivations. Yeah, they're 90% effective. Variants make it worse. Long COVID is terrible. Case rates are dropping. So why not just wait literally like a month? We've continued some of our old behaviors. We don't go to indoor places. We continue to be pretty careful with what we do. We use our masks outside when we pass people. We now shop. We didn't for a year indoors. We wear our masks. We got medical air grade filters, which we run when we have workers in the house or guests. We did go to Santa Barbara for two weeks in mid April. I use an equation to figure out whether it was safe, again, using that flu. And we were really careful in what we did. And when the case rate gets green, it's about one in 100,000, New Jersey's three to four now, then we'll really relax. Okay, retrospective. This is a first semester. Okay, the disease. The red ones are the ones that I think are the big messages. Man, it messes us up, but it's here to stay. We're not gonna have herd immunity. We really still don't understand that the number of papers that come out on why it affects people. What is long COVID? Why are people super spreaders? We don't know. Treatment. These vaccines are spectacular. I think we're gonna have them at least annually. Therapeutics, these antivirals, things that stop the virus are very, very good. Respiratory or elusive. Again, if you have the symptoms, quickly go to a large hospital. Behavior, socioeconomic folks can be safe. We know how to be safe. It was also easier for us to get vaccinated. Not true for the socioeconomic disadvantage. Rich countries can be safe. Not all were. Well, the reasons we've already discussed. Some countries didn't stand a chance. Masks are here to stay. Impact. We discussed the impact. It is particularly terrible if you've had a friend or a relative who have died, who have had this long COVID. But the world has changed. It's more virtual, inequitable, fragile, and it's very, very angry. The future, India is only the first of the underdeveloped countries. This race will continue. It's not over. My question is, when can I give this talk? Love to be able to give this talk. Problem is, I don't know how many semesters until the term ends. Okay, done. Okay, anyone who wants to ask questions, please raise your hands and remember to ask questions. We don't want uh, long discussions of what you've done. Okay, first question, Mitch Erickson. Hey, Mitch. Hey, Bob. Uh as always, thanks a lot. Uh, uh, two questions about the work you've done as opposed to the work you summarized here. Uh, number one is, are you gonna publish that the statistical survey that was roughly in the middle? And also, I'm just curious, uh, this is a lot, a lot, a lot of work you've done. And are you, are you giving this 
presentation. I hope you're giving this presentation to many, many groups, because if you did this all for us, 100 and, 106 guys, uh, that was not a not a uh, good return on your investment. OK, uh, <clears throat> uh, first, oh, thank you. My wife brought up some water. Um, <clears throat> I, I actually have been thinking about publishing that thing. Um, and um, I've been <laughs> busy, um, you know, working on this talk. Um, I, I had given us it elsewhere, though you guys have been the main audience. Um, I've really enjoyed it because, as I mentioned the first time, you learn a lot from reading. You learn even more from writing. You learn the most by having to speak about it, you know, because you focus, you simplify. Uh, so I really have appreciated the opportunity. Ron Weinger. Um, yes, I, I have two questions. Uh, has anyone ever come up with a theory as to why the mutations, variations, haven't uh, resulted in a less virulent form of the virus? And the second one is, do you have any recommendations for staying in a hotel or motel during this period? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, the, the, there is a theory in evolution that says that the less deadly versions happen. Um, the theory on this one that I've read is the reason this is not the case is if the virus is more transmissible, then it can replicate more and therefore spread more as long as it doesn't kill too many people. So there's this really interesting balance on transmission and mortality. Okay, so, you know, it's a, you know, from, from what I've read, really tough, interesting question. Um, I can tell you what some of our friends have done uh, with motels. So, you know, it's obviously getting better and better. Um, they have brought their own linen. Um, and when they go inside, they disinfect. Um, the ones, uh, some have found uh, motels where you can use your smartphones for entrance and exit. Uh, those are the main things I've heard people do. And then, if, you know, of course, when you're around a motel and whatever, masks, you know, standard stuff. Any others? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, uh, due to a, a friend of my wife's husband, who is a retired infectious disease specialist, um, somehow I got on his email list, uh, you know, which is with a bunch of other doctors. And a couple of things came out of that email that he sent around. And one is that the CDC was always talking about um, droplets and a six foot radius and all that kind of stuff. And this, uh, this is applicable to maybe, you know, most viruses, but uh, they recognized early on that the model was more like the aerosol that spreads hundreds of, you know, tens of feet like you mentioned. And it's actually the model behind TB, how it spreads because it spreads at very long distances. Yep. And, and yet within the medical community, they were kind of shut down from saying that, you know, so I'm glad you brought that point out. You know, the other thing is um, he came across a, uh, you know, uh, ad hoc randomized study that showed that the antidepressant, which was a SSRI type, you know, serotonin inhibitor um, called fluvoxamine, Actually, when people wound up in the hospital, um, if they were given that, they actually had no deaths at all. And the long haul symptoms that some people had that recovered, uh, they had almost none of that. And I didn't see that in any of your presentation. Did you know about that or? 
Um, yeah, let, <clears throat> yes. Um, okay, uh, first in the aerosol spray. The CDC was very slow in pointing out that aerosol spray you know, was the main thing. And a, um, a recent Nature paper just tore into them you know, on that, you know, as probably the CDC's biggest failure. Um, <clears throat> yeah, let me tell you the reason I didn't mention that. It, it also ties into a um, Nature paper. Are you talking about provoxamine or? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, it was a pretty small study. And the number of small studies early on that have looked super encouraging that later on people find haven't worked is the majority of the studies I've read. So I'm very cautious until I read in a peer reviewed large study, you know, this is the thing to take. Well, it's kind, of, it's kind of tough to do these large scale studies on something as dangerous as COVID. So, um, and, and the other thing is the thing that made people even look into it was the fact that somebody much earlier noticed that this was very effective in treating septus, which is a blood borne yeah. disease. And it, you know, it, it was able to make people recover from that. So they had the idea of trying it on COVID patients and it happened to work. Right. You know, so anyway, thanks for a very good talk and follow up. Oh, no, no, thank you. I appreciate it. Hey, Edkin? Yes, Rob, very informative talk that you gave. I enjoyed it very much. I have some questions. You know, one is I've gone to several movies recently. Is there any position which is safe in the theater? I try to sit toward the back. I mean, mostly very empty theaters. Um, like most I've ever seen is seven so far. I've seen three movies by myself. Yeah, um, well, first thing, be sure to wear your mask. <laughs> well, I've been by myself in a theater three times, so. Yeah, yeah, but, but I was saying, if I were to go to a theater, I would be sure to wear my mask. And by the way, I always wear an N95 mask. The um, um, distance, I'm, I'm thinking, uh, two thoughts are going through mine. One, uh, this study was done by MIT, by the way, uh, peer reviewed. Uh, this aerosol stuff spreads, you know, at least 60 feet. Um, theaters often have good ventilation, so that should help. Um, I would speculate sitting in the back is better than the front, but I, I have no studies to, you know, justify that. And also, why why are the Republic people that are associated with the Republican Party have such a don't want to take the vaccine? Like, we're mostly more the Democrats. Do. Yeah, um, there there are lots of guesses on that. Um, <clears throat> one of the um, guesses, which I actually uh, is one of my major guesses is belief in science. Um, and it is, that is correlated both with general education, um, the belief of their leaders, and their leaders have not been as uh, enthusiastic about getting the vaccines. You know, you know, Trump made one, you know, minor comment which closed with, but then it's individual choice. Like, I think it's very sad. It's going to cause a lot of, lot, just a lot of deaths. Okay, it is 11.45, so we really got to bring this pretty close to an end. We'll do one more question, Paul. I defer to Rand Cholet. Cholet, okay, go ahead. To allow it. Thank you. I, okay. Am I unmuted now? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Just, just very quickly, I discovered something unexpected in the in the uh, session today that from college I had PTSD, which was post-traumatic software disorder. <laughs> and I think I may have found the cause of that was Al Aho. 
because uh, Potsdam, Northern New York was considered, or at least we believed we were the first <laughs> four year degree in computer science. IBM needed, as a, <laughs> I know, they were taking musicians and stuff off the street in the early years and they needed professional structured thing. Well, our senior class project, Al, was a five person team and it's challenging to do a two pass compiler. We were challenged with doing a one pass Pascal compiler and to this day. It has an effect on me. And uh, Bob, I just wanted to say that your talk, uh, the amount of information that's out there, what you pulled together, I'd say your talk was pretty infectious. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Nolan. Okay. Well, I have one word to say. Wow. <laughs> wow. I'm going to be number 556 because I was the only holdout who didn't read your first talk. <laughs> Unbelievable. Brilliant, massive content. And as a communicator, your communication skills are fantastic. Oh, aren't you and, and, and we're very, very happy uh, to thank you. And, and uh, maybe there'll be a number three. I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, you've probably seen this before. This is our tradition. We have a certificate of appreciation from the Summit Old Guard. We started in 1930. I don't think any of us are still around, but uh, the orchid is our symbol. We were the orchid growing capital uh, of a large region in 1930. It's obviously all suburbs now, but we love our, we love our traditions. And I want to give you deepest thanks and, and an Old Guard salute for a fantastic presentation. Okay, everyone, you can unmute yourself. Yay, thank you. Um, Fantastic. Thanks, Justin Beaver. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, and thank you, Nolan, for a great, great month. 